The birth of a dragon seems to be connected to fire and death. Does birthing a dragon require a human sacrifice? So let's start talking about this new book, um, The World of Ice and Fire. Um, I've been telling people who ask me about it that it's sort of the Silmarillion of your imaginary world. Um, and you wrote it with a couple of co-authors, so I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about whether it is the Silmarillion of the known world and, um, and about what it was like to work with Elio and Linda. <clears throat> well, um, this is a book that really began with my readers and my fans. Um, of course, in any epic fantasy, um, the world is a character. Setting is, uh, is very important. And that, I think, has certainly been true since J.R. Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. Uh, of course, fantasy goes back to ancient times, the, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Ballad of Gilgamesh. Um, but Tolkien really invented modern epic fantasy in its current form. And, and one of the things he did that was extraordinary was create Middle-earth in such detail. If you look at some of the pre-Tolkien fantasy, it's, it's written more in a story of fairy tales, you know. Once upon a time, there was a king, and the king had a beautiful daughter, and there was an evil vizier. And they may have names, but you won't know, like, who was the king's father, or who was his grandfather, or how the dynasty came to power, or how long it's ruled, or what the neighboring countries are. It's, it's, it's all told in this fairy tale thing. Tolkien gave us all these histories, uh, all these appendices and genealogies, and uh, um, everything was, was rooted, and it, it seemed as real as England or France or Germany when you, when you read these things. And since then, that's become the style for epic fantasy. It's something that fantasy readers now expect. They expect a, a fully realized secondary world, as Tolkien called it. And so certainly that's what I uh, set out to create in, in Westeros. Now some of this is a magician's trick. It, it really wasn't with Tolkien. Um, you have to consider that Tolkien is, uh, was a very, very unusual writer. I mean, he was a linguist and a philosopher and, a, and a, he spoke Old Norse and Old English. He was fascinated by myth. You know, he, he, the story was almost secondary to Tolkien. He spent years creating his Cimmerillion, never published it in his lifetime. And Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit were like stories set in the world he created, but for him the world creation and the creation of languages was almost primary. Um, if you look at it like an iceberg, he, uh, you know, they say the three quarters of an iceberg is hidden below the, below the surface. That was certainly true with Tolkien. With a lot of the fantasists who have followed Tolkien though, it's a magician's trick. We have some ice on a raft, and we, <laughs> we want you to think that there's this huge edifice <laughs> underneath, just like with Tolkien, but there really isn't in, in some cases. And that was probably true with me in the beginning. I mean, I began with the story and the characters and the scene, and everything grew from that. But the world grew along with the story, and I rapidly discovered as I got into the writing that the readers wanted to know more and more about this world. Which of the locations do you feel the most true to what you imagined? Uh, in the TV show? Yeah. Um, well, there are locations. I mean, we're, we're shooting, you know, in Belfast. Mm -hmm. We're shooting in, uh, we've shot some in Scotland. But Belfast and Northern Ireland is our ma main location. We've also shot in Iceland. We're shooting in Spain right now. We've done a lot in Croatia. We've used Morocco and Malta um, in past years. So there's many, many different uh, actual existing locations that, uh, that have been used over, over the years. Um, none of them are exactly what I described in my book, uh, but they sure are gorgeous. I mean, I, I think we're the, probably the best looking show on television. Yeah. Um, and some of the interior sets are pretty amazing, too. Do you get frustrated ever when it's not quite what you imagined? I would say 
I wouldn't say frustrating. I mean, sometimes it's it's better, you know. I, th I think like their uh, their version of the high hall of the Aaron's uh, with the moon door in the floor is probably better than my moon door, which is just a door set in the wall. Because uh, I didn't think of putting it in the floor. <laughs> uh, that was pretty cool. I like. You know, the, the show's Iron Throne has become uh, iconic. Mm. It's now recognized around the world. It's, it's numerous people have done parodies. You know, Mad Magazine has had a version made of toilet plungers, and uh, <laughs> they, they've shown, you know, sports commissioners have sat on ones made of baseball bats, and uh, their, their actual physical versions of the throne is like six of them in the United States, and three or four of them in Britain, and Spain has one, and, you know, these travel around for publicity, so I recognize it's a, it's a great looking throne and it has become iconic, but it's not really my Iron Throne. Uh, in this book, you'll see my Iron we Throne. We have one of the slides we have. Yeah, the, I mean, I state repeatedly in the book that the Iron Stone is huge. Huge. Um, it, it towers over the room like a great beast, and it's ugly, it's asymmetric. It, 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 uh, it's, it was put together by blacksmiths, not by craftsmen and experts in furniture manufacture. Uh, and you have to walk up iron steps, and when a king sits on it, he's like 10 feet above everybody else in the hall, so he's in this raised position looking down on him. And the hall itself is, is huge. Um, and the throne is made of the swords of the defeated enemies. Yeah, the throne, the throne is made of... Uh, the, all the swords, you know, when during Aegon's conquest, when people surrendered to them, they they set down their sword as a series of submission. And of course, when he won a battle by burning everybody, there were all these burned, melted swords lying around. So he gathered all of them up and he gave them and said, "Make a throne out of this." And that's what they did. And it's a, it's a sign of dominance and conquest. Um, and when you stand before it, you're supposed to. Remember that, you know, look on my works, ye mighty and despair, uh, was a little bit of the, uh, of the psychology of that. But nobody ever got it right. I mean, there were comic book versions, and there were versions in the card game, and the, and the board game, and there were versions on the cover, and there were versions that were done for conventions. You know, the very first, there was a wooden one that I sat on in 1996 at the, at the ABA uh, that looked like the embossed version on the first edition of the Silver Book, but none of them were ever really right. Um, the closest one who ever came was, was Mark Simonetti, the French artist, and even his first one wasn't right, but since he was the closest, I worked with him, and then we got him for this book, and he and I went back a half dozen times to finally get something I could say, yeah, this is, this is absolutely right. Now, of course, you can't do this in a TV show. It's not something I criticize HBO for or something like that. I mean, the, the thrones they have are enormously large and, and cumbersome to move and expensive to build. To build this monstrosity would, would blow the budget of an entire episode, and it wouldn't fit in the set. I mean, our throne room, our throne room is, is uh, in the paint hall in, Bel in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Now, the paint hall is the largest soundstage in Europe. It was a, it originally part of the old Harlan and Wolf shipyard where they built the Titanic and they painted the, the ships, uh, the hulls of the ships in, in this hole, which gives you an idea of the scale of it. And we've divided it into a number of pods and our throne room is in one of them. And it's a very large set, but it's not large enough. You would need St. Paul's Cathedral. If, if they would give us St. Paul's Cathedral or <laughs> Westminster Abbey to shoot in, and a year to build a giant throne like that of, of, that would dominate the entire thing and go halfway to the ceiling, then you could get the Iron Throne the way it's described in the books. But this is the difference between books and television. You know, I can, I can say, well, that the wall is 700 feet high, but I don't actually have to build a 7 foot, 100 foot high wall or a giant throne made of, made of nasty looking swords here. Do your books have any references to the Grateful Dead? You call your home Terrapin Station, and the song Dire Wolf and Cassidy and Dark Star have names and references in the books. Well, I'm certainly a fan of the Grateful Dead. I've attended uh, Grateful Dead um, concerts, and uh, my wife Paris is perhaps even more of a fan of the Grateful Dead. And 
There are a lot of Grateful Dead references in my, uh, my famous rock and roll uh, novel, The Armageddon Rag. In fact, at one point, we were hoping to uh, make a movie of that and, and film the, the con Nazgul concert scenes at Grateful Dead concerts. Um, but of course, that came to nothing, sad to say. Um, and I do have Grateful Dead lyrics always coming around and rattling around in my head. Ripple is one of my favorite songs of all time. There is a road, no simple highway. <laughs> but actually in this book, I don't know. Or any know. of the Ice and Fire books? It sounds like these are. Uh, maybe, I, I, I'd have to think about that. Not intentionally. Not that I can remember. The birth of a dragon seems to be connected to fire and death. Does birthing a dragon require a human sacrifice? <laughs> Interesting notion. I mean, there are clues in the, <laughs> in the books, uh, so, you know, I, I think I'm gonna dodge that one right now. <laughs> um, there's a rumor that when you met with David Benioff and Dan Weiss to talk, who are the showrunners of the HPS show, to talk about adapting the books, there was one question that you asked them. Yes, that's true. That's, yeah. that's not a rumor, that's true. Okay. I asked them an important question because I wanted to determine how carefully they had, uh, they had read the books. And that question is, who is Jon Snow's mother? That was the question, yes. So and I, I will that. say no more about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, you know, we had a great meeting at the at the Palm Restaurant in Los Angeles. We met for hours and discussed the books for hours, and uh, you know, it was it was great. But in Hollywood, um, and this is the first time I'd met either David and Dan. I was I was. Uh, you know, when I, the meeting was set up, I looked them up, and of course, I was already familiar with some of David's works, not, not quite so much with Dan, but I knew their credits, and uh, it was, certainly seemed to be a great meeting, but, you know, in Hollywood, there's a lot of bullshit artists out there, so, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to be careful. So I, I wanted to, you know, they, they said they'd read the books, and they loved them, and I thought I'd see how carefully <laughs> they had read the books and they passed with flying colors, yeah, so yeah, it was great. Position. All right, well, um, thank you uh, to George. <laughs>